Hi, Les from Thailand, and today's video is going to be about my costliest divorce. I did, just did a video recently about losing it all, or did I? So there's a link there if you want to go watch that video. It's had a lot of views in the past couple of days. So this is sort of just a follow on because there was so much interest with regard to people getting divorced. And I'm sure 80% of the people here that are living in Thailand have gone through that experience. And I just want to do a video on my costliest divorce and the good result that I got out of it afterwards. If you watch till the end of the video, you'll see how I avoided paying my huge solicitor's bill. I don't recommend it for everybody to do, do it this way, but it gave me a little bit of satisfaction. Now, my most costly divorce was my second divorce, um, basically because we've been married for quite a long time and we had had a couple of kids. Anybody knows if you've got a couple of kids getting divorced, you, you're screwed, basically. You ain't going to win, but I sort of had that in mind. Now, the divorce was sort of complicated, and I'm not going to go into the story why we ended up getting divorced, but it was a, a sad situation as how it came to this. But, but by the by, going through the divorce, we had three houses. I had uh, a number of businesses. I was a firefighter. I had my own electrical business. I had a children's entertainment business. My wife was at home with the kids, so she was a housewife. So therefore, she looked after the kids and didn't work because she asked not to work. So I worked extra so she didn't have to work. So she was at home for the kids. So my kids weren't latchkey kids, which I didn't mind. I didn't mind working extra to provide my security to my wife and my kids. But come divorce, um, she wanted me to move out of the house, and which was impossible because at the time it was sort of a perfect storm. The interest rates had risen to 15%. The house prices had crashed. There was a lot of bad economics happening at the time of divorce. So it was sort of a perfect storm. The divorce came at the probably worst possible time that you could, as far as finances were concerned. We had mortgages on three houses. And as I say, my businesses, I was working seven days a week when the, the divorce happened. So it was sort of an impossibility for me to go out of the house, go and rent somewhere, give her maintenance and pay maintenance for the children whilst the divorce was going on. So I was living in the house, we were, I was downstairs, she was living upstairs. And as you can understand, it probably isn't the best solution, but I said to my wife, if she took over the mortgage payments, I'd freely move out of the house and rent somewhere and then start paying her maintenance once the divorce was finalised. So as I'd been divorced before, I knew sort of the ropes, what was going on. And just a, a word of warning, do not become a cash cow. Because you will. You'll end up being a cash cow for the solicitors. The solicitors like nothing more than you and your partner to argue and argue and argue, because then it involves more letters, more court appearances, and that just quadruples the cost of your divorce. So anyway, getting back to my divorce, because I'd done most of it before in my first divorce, so I sort of knew the ropes, I decided to do a lot of the work for my divorce, sort of writing letters. I kept it all in chronological order. Everything that I received, phone calls, marked everything down. Everything that I gave, everything that I gave from the bank, everything was logged down to perfection. Going through the divorce, and we got to our first divorce meeting at court. Now, Again, a little insight with regard to court. Very, very rarely does the you know, divorce finish on the first court hearing because the, the solicitors will make up something so it'll just carry on so they can carry on milking the cash cow with regard to money. Very, very rarely it's finished on the first result. So, of course, I was defending myself against the solicitor. The judge asked me whether I was OK with that. So then I was asked to go negotiate with my ex-partner's solicitor. So we sat in a room and basically he said, this is what I want. And he thought I was stupid. He thought I didn't know what, what was happening. And I just sort of belittled him because of his demeaningful way against me, thinking I was just Mr. Nobody. So of course he came up with these proposals and it was preposterous what he was asking for because I w was working and the amount of maintenance payments. And I just told them then and there, so right, that's it. 
I'm going to stop all my businesses, I'm just going to be a firefighter, I'm going to pay what maintenance I'm going to pay with regard to a firefighter salary. So, but he still insisted on taking half of my pension, taking the full possession of the house. So it was just stupid, ridiculous what he was asking for. And because he thought I was not represented by a solicitor, he could take advantage of somebody who didn't know the law. So anyway, he gave me another day, a month later. So I had a month to prepare my counter proposals. And the judge said, if, if we don't come to any agreement, the judge will make a decision with regard to my divorce. So it was, was following this, there, there was lots of money being asked for and stupidity, just ludicrous what he was asking for, for my divorce settlement. So I consulted a couple of solicitors, you get a free half an hour with a couple of solicitors, and this second solicitor that I went to see was very, very expensive, but I said, this is the agreement that they're, they're after. I laid all my cards on the table, this is what I've got, this is what I'm earning, this is what I plan to do. And she said, oh yeah, we can do much, much better than, than what they're asking for. So I asked again, are you sure you can do, get a better deal than this? Because it was just stupid. And by this time, we only had two weeks to go before we were due to go to court. So I give them all the details, which was in chronological order, every date, every piece of information that I had. It was in a folder and it was easy to read and find out the progress of the divorce. So because they had two weeks to prepare, they said, oh, this is going to be a rush job. And, um, you know, you've left it to the last minute, two weeks. I said, well, you've got all the information there. You've got everything there, so it can be done, I think, in quick time. So anyway, I got no further correspondence from the solicitors, apart from the odd phone call saying it's going well. And then on the day of the divorce hearing, I got a phone call from the solicitor on a car phone, and she said to me, this is the proposals, Les, of what we're going to propose to the solicitor at the courts today. This was actually on the final hearing of the courts. And when she told me the proposals that she was going to give to her solicitor, I asked her to repeat what her proposals were. And then when she said the proposals again, so I didn't mishear what she said, I asked the question, why are you giving them more than what they were asking for in the first place? Obviously very angry at what her reply is. And her reply was, well, he didn't think you were going to get away with it scot-free. And my answer on the phone was, but I didn't expect my solicitor to give them more than what they're asking for. I'll see you at court. So as you can understand, I'm raging and I'm fuming at that. This is the solicitor's work for two weeks of what she's actually done for me. And also during the two weeks, I forgot to mention that she insisted that we hire a barrister to represent me at court to do the negotiations. Now bearing in mind this divorce took place in 2002, the barrister for his attendance at court, whether he was there for 30 minutes or whether he was there for seven hours, was 700 pounds for the day and my solicitor was on £150 an hour for my solicitor. So I was on my way to court fuming because of the phone call she gave me and I got to court and in the little lawyer's room that you get ushered to in the first place to have a discussion with your, your lawyer before the commencement of your divorce period, there was the main solicitor, £150 an hour. There was a trainee solicitor, £80 an hour. There was a secretary taking notes at £40 an hour. There was the barrister at £700 the day. And I asked for this particular day why so many people are in attendance to my court hearing. And she said, these are the people necessary for today. So I'm just fuming. The cost of this day was going to, I knew then was going to be horrendous. And she brought all of these files and books and I'm thinking, where's all this paperwork come from? Where's all of this, what's all of this for two weeks work? So then anyway, we were arguing over the proposals. And when I showed the, propos the original proposals from her solicitor to what she was going to offer, the answer was, hmm. That was it, hmm. 
She said, oh yes, I see there is a bit of a discrepancy here. I said, two weeks you've been doing this, two weeks, and you call it a discrepancy. I'm sat there fuming, fuming really, really angry with the situation that I'm being fleeced here by my lawyers. So anyway, Barrister went out, in and out, in and out the rooms. Well, what about this, what about that? And my big picture was to save my pension. I didn't care what I lost at that stage because I had another six or seven years to do before I could retire. And the biggest thing that I didn't want to lose my pension. I didn't care about the house because I was never going to keep part of the house um, because I had children and any woman with children is going to win the house in the first place. So I sort of knew I was going to lose that. They disagree with me with the fact that, that I said I was going to pack in all my jobs and they said, we don't believe you're going to stop all your work. So therefore we want a higher payment, monthly payment for your wife and children because you, you get this extra income from having your properties and from having your electrical business and your children's entertainment business. And I said, no, I'm going to pack everything in. So the barrister came back again and says, no, they still want half your pension. So feeling angry at this, I asked the barrister, I said, listen, I'm going to go and see my wife's barrister and I'm going to see what the feeling is. So I went to see my wife's barrister and I was sort of shocked because he was pleasant and he was uh, open to negotiation. I'm thinking, what's my barrister been doing all of this time? So I asked my ex-wife's barrister whether he minded if I did the negotiations from now on. And he said, it's up to you, it's your court case. So I went back to my legal department, or my legal representatives, and I said to the barrister, take a seat. I don't want to be using you anymore. I know your fee, whether you're there for 30 minutes or whether you're all there. I said, I'll pay your fee. Much to the anger of the solicitor, who says, why are you paying us to represent you then if you're going to do it yourself? And my reply to them was, because I think I can do a better job than all of you put together. I said, stay seated there as I'm going to go do the negotiations myself. Went back to my ex-wife's barrister and we thrashed it out. Basically, I took on all the debts. She got the house. I kept my pension, which was far, far better deal than what my barrister was going to do because his last proposal was that I only got a quarter of the house, she got half my pension, I took on all the debts, and the maintenance payments per month were astronomical. So for me, my outcome was, he agreed that I'd finish all my jobs and I'd pay a reasonable amount of maintenance just from my firefighter salary. I lost the house completely, she got the house. Uh, I took on all her debts, and um, I kept my pension. This took 15 minutes to sort out, bearing in mind we've been in the court for about two or three hours and my barrister had been going backwards and forwards for all of this time. So done deal, my barrister had to go in to the room and sign all the details to say that, yeah, this is official, it wasn't just my hearsay. And the divorce was done. Obviously, a lot of bad feeling between me and my lawyers. And she said, come into the office next week and we'll sort out a payment plan. So divorce finished, and that's when my wife said to me in the passing in the hallway, and I always remember her words were, I thought you had a good lawyer until I got everything. And my reply to that was, you might have won the battle, but you haven't won the war. So the following week, made an appointment, went to see my solicitor, and that's when the bombshell hit as to how much my divorce was going to be. I'd already paid 2,000 pounds deposit, and with the intentions of paying monthly for my divorce representation. So the bombshell dropped when she said, you owe us 8,000 pounds. And my eyes just came out like stalks. And I, I asked again, 8,000 pounds? So altogether my divorce bill was 10,000 pounds for two weeks work. And I said, break down the costs. She said, photocopying charges, 2,000 pounds. I said, 2,000, I said, you can buy a photocopier for 2,000 pounds. How come it costs 2,000 pounds for all the photocopy? He said, we had to photocopy everything for our records. We had to photocopy everything for the barrister. So she said, we had to have five copies of everything. So she said, that's why it took so much 
we had to pay a secretary to photocopy all of these pages and because he was rushed in two weeks she said a lot of work went into this the trainee solicitor did most of work to keep your costs down she said so that's why he appeared at court so eight thousand pounds i agreed to pay 250 pounds a week starting from the following month begrudgingly she said okay and then i had an appointment with my financial advisor with regard to the mounting debts that had crept up because I wasn't working, I wasn't paying the mortgages for the houses because I wasn't working, so therefore I didn't earn that amount of money, knowing far well that I was going to um, stop all of the works. There was a financial crisis going on, so the prices of houses had dropped and the interest rates had gone high, and with the added cost of having to rent somewhere because I got divorced, uh, it, it was just a financial nightmare it became. So because of all this financial nightmare, um, my fin financial advisor advised me to go bankrupt. Um, because she, she said, that's the best solution. You've got, nothing, you've got nothing to lose. So she said, as far as my advice to you is, go bankrupt. Now from being very solvent and being uh, hardworking and never had any debt problems before, I found this a bitter pill to swallow but it made sense of what she was saying. So, so reluctantly, I went bankrupt. So for my financial advisor, that put a big smile on her face. Cause she said, I'm going to enjoy writing this letter the most. And she wrote to the solicitors saying that because my client has gone bankrupt, you ain't going to get your 8,000 8, pounds. So it did put a smile on my face also knowing that I didn't have to pay £8,000 to my solicitors. And the financial advisor says, if you're getting any threatening letters from the solicitors, you are entitled to take them to court for harassment of trying to get your money. And what happened, as soon as they got their letter, I got phone calls, I got letters from the solicitors saying they were going to take me to court, going to sue me for the £8,000. So I give this to my financial advisor. She wrote back to the solicitors saying, if you give my client any more letters like this, we're going to take you to court for financial harassment. And then I got a nice softly, softly letter from the solicitors. They said they would accept any payments I was prepared to offer over a, an extended period of time to pay their bill off without paying any interest. So I wrote a nice letter back to them saying, due to my financial circumstances, I will not be making any payments towards my debt towards your solicitor's firm please don't contact me again in the future. So this is how I avoided paying my solicitor's bill. I never thought I'd end up through bankruptcy and it was just a situation that happened because of the financial crisis. It was like a perfect storm, going through the divorce, paying maintenance, it was just horrendous. And obviously my other streams of income had stopped because I stopped working as an electrician, I stopped working as a children's entertainer, I didn't do any other jobs, just being a firefighter for a couple of years. And yet I paid for that. And my bankruptcy lasted for three years, which was very difficult. But my advice for those people who are going through a divorce, don't become a cash cow through solicitors and lawyers. Be very, very careful. Um, I wish anybody that's going through a divorce the best of luck. Um, it is painful, it is costly. And if you can avoid it, do it at all costs. So from Les, living the dream in Thailand. Till the next video, bye for now.